Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Dupree, the Program Director at Lighthouse Writers Workshop, and welcome to our 15th annual Lit Fest, the very first ever virtual Lit Fest that we've done, probably, maybe, hopefully, optimistically, the last. Um, I'm missing all your faces. I miss being on that porch. I miss hearing music. I miss all of this stuff. Uh, but it's really great that you all could be here tonight. Um, we're excited about this happy hour reading with Garth Greenwell and Sheila Hetty. Um, I want to remind you too that if you missed any of the other readings, yesterday there was a great one with Hanif Abdurraqib and Ariana Rains. And the day before we had Akil Sharma and Emily Rab Black and um, Jamie Attenberg. Those are on supposedly, allegedly on our YouTube channel. Um, I think it's true. And if it's not, just let me know. And we'll get that up on our YouTube channel. We also have great salons from the past weeks or so. Um, Denez Smith and um, Francesca Sloan and a bunch of writers got together last week to talk about, what were they talking about? It was really good. They were, they were talking about real life and real art and things like that. So anyway, you can tune in at any time. Um, free and open to all of you. Before we get started, I wanted to thank the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bonfi Stanton Foundation, and Colorado Creative In Industries for helping make Lit Fest 2020 possible. All of you on the other side of this Zoom, you also made it possible, so thank you. Um, we, we are, you will see that we are the only three you can see right now, a lot of people text me and say, I'm not on the screen, what is going on? Um, you can still communicate with us via the um, Q&A button down at the bottom. And after the two readings today, we'll get your questions in there if, if at all possible. So please don't, don't stress out. Consider this a time to just listen and commune in a different way. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing our first reader, Garth Greenwell, and then um, Sheila and I will disappear for a while and we'll hear from him and then Sheila will come on and then we'll have a little conversation afterwards. So Garth Greenwell, who's here this week working with 10 fiction writers who are all in love, I have to say, I keep hearing from them how great his class is. Um, he will also be featured at the salon tomorrow night, staring at the eclipse, writing about things that are too hard to write about. So check that out. He's the author of What Belongs to You, which won the British Book Award for debut of the year, was long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award, the LA Times Book Prize, and several other awards. A new book of fiction, Cleanness, was published in January and has just now, I mean, this is fresh news, this is breaking. It has been long listed for the UK's Gordon Byrne Prize. I think it should win. Um, his fiction has appeared in the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and a public space, and his nonfiction has appeared in Harper's, the London Review of Books, the Atlantic and elsewhere. A 2020 Guggenheim Fellow he lives in Iowa City. Can't wait to hear his reading. Hi, you guys. Um, greetings from Iowa City. Uh, thanks so much, Andrea, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody at Lighthouse for letting me be part of this this week. Um, I wanted to say um, it's such a thrill and an honor to get to read for the first time with my friend Sheila Hetty, who's one of my favorite um, living writers and one of the world's few true geniuses. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my new book, Cleanness, um, from a chapter called Decent People. I've been thinking in the last few weeks, as I think all of us have, about um, what it means to be a citizen and what it means to put one's body in the street as a citizen. As a citizen. Um, and uh, what protest means. Um, so this chapter is set um, in the 2013 uh, protests that happened in Sofia, Bulgaria. The narrator is an American high school teacher um, who has been living and working in Sofia for four years. And um, he's about to leave and return to the United States. And so he's on the streets as an observer of this kind of astonishing manifestation of 
joy and rage and hope um, uh, that took place over many months in Bulgaria. Um, as part of this, he runs into one of his students, um, a student named M. Uh, who's a senior and who's about to leave the country as well to go to university in Berlin. Um, I don't think you need to know anything else. Uh, maybe just one word of Bulgarian, which is the word ostavka, which means resignation in the sense of a government resigning, which is the primary demand of the protesters that the extraordinarily corrupt government resign. So I'm starting in the middle and I'm not gonna get to the end, but this is just a piece. <clears throat> There's never been anything like this, Im said then. I mean, maybe in 1989, but nothing I've ever seen. Something's really happening. I feel like I'm part of something, not just here, but something bigger. It's the same as what's happening in Taksim Square in Brazil, the Arab Spring. Something is happening, something real. I think there's a chance for things really to change. I felt this too. It wasn't to challenge her that I asked what she thought that change would be. She shrugged. I'm not sure, she said, but I feel like we'll figure it out. She paused. I feel powerful in a way I never have before, she said, and then she glanced at me and laughed. I feel like one of the Opolchensi on Shipka. These were Bulgarian volunteers who fought with the Russians against the Ottomans. There was a poem about them by Ivan Vasov that every Bulgarian knew. I had heard a poet declaim it once, drunk at a dinner party, the room quiet with reverence. I feel the power of the people, she said gingerly, cringing at the cliché. Then she laughed again, pointing, and I saw that ahead of us a group of women were dancing on the sidewalk, their hair wet, their sundresses clinging to their bodies, and several stories above them, an elderly man, shirtless and bald, his skin hanging loose around his frame, held a garden hose, pointing it up and half blocking the end with his thumb so that water fell down like rain. It was his gift to us, a chance to cool down, though most of the marchers avoided it, leaving it to the young women who would be cold soon enough. The heat was fading. Even on warm days, the nights could be cool. It was an instant allegory, youth and age, Hephaestus and the graces, and then my mind shuffled to the side a step and I thought of the water cannons in Taksim Square of the luck that had held here so far. Im turned her head as we passed them, then looked back at me smiling. My parents don't like that I come, she said. They don't like the government, but they're afraid of violence. They're afraid I'll get in trouble with the police. But it's not like that at all, she said. People aren't angry. There's so much joy here, she said. They don't understand that. Have you ever seen so much joy? It makes me wish I weren't leaving, she went on. My whole life I've been dying to get out of here and now I feel like I want to stay. This made me remember the taxi driver and what he had said about the changes in 1989, how he had wasted his life for an idealism that had curdled. But I didn't say this. I put my arm around her and squeezed her shoulder, another breach of decorum. I mean, look at that, she said after I dropped my arm and she pointed at a sign being carried by a man just in front of us. The crowd had bunched and slowed as people climbed the stairs that led from the boulevard up to the plaza at Indica, the Palace of Culture. I almost never came to Indica this way. I always circled around to the other side. I only climbed these stairs once a year, I realized, for the Pride March, when the organizers used the stairs for a security check. We opened our bags and showed our IDs and had colored plastic bands attached to our wrists so that the police could tell us apart from the protesters who would line our path. Im was pointing at a poster that showed a bearded man's face and beneath it in block letters the name Vazov, the writer who had given Im her Opolchensi, and beside that another face, this one labeled Botov, another beloved poet. There was a whole group of them marching together, each with the face of a writer. There were Elin Pelin and Petko Slavikov, and my favorite of the classic writers, Jordan Yovkov, the most elegant, he should be better known in English. Isn't that beautiful, Im said. Tell me, where else do they march with their poets? And I had to admit that I didn't know. 
Certainly not in America, I said. That's something you would never see there. And she smiled. I could see this gratified her. We had talked about those writers in one of my classes earlier that week. It was a conversation class, which the ministry required, though it was useless for our students who were fluent and spoke English all day. We only met for an hour once a week, but it was a struggle to fill the time. I had asked a few of them to choose a short video, anything they wanted, something they could talk about and get the class talking to. We had just watched something about Bulgaria, a promotional clip from the tourism board, which had sweeping aerial shots of mountains and countryside of fields of sunflower and lavender, and then curious historical reenactments, men in medieval armor riding on horseback, women in 19th century folk dress dancing the horo all of it to a soundtrack of bagpipes and drums. It makes me feel proud, the student who brought it in said. There are so many problems in Bulgaria, but this, I don't know, it makes me feel proud for my country. She sat down then, quickly, relieved. She wasn't in my regular English class. I taught her that single period and didn't know her well, and she was quiet, one of the students I had to encourage to speak. She had barely settled in her chair when another student started talking, a girl I knew well and whom I never had to encourage. It was the opposite with her. I had to rein her in at times, which was my only job in that class, to hold the reins, not to steer them in any particular direction, but to try to equalize engagement. The student was bursting to speak. It was all she could do not to interrupt. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry, I don't mean to diss your video. Her English was the best in the class, she was a hair's breadth from sounding like any American kid. I don't mean to diss your video, but I'm so sick of this nostalgia bullshit. Sorry, she said, glancing at me, though she knew I didn't care if they cursed in class. Sorry, but all this men on horseback crap, what does that have to do with Bulgaria? I mean, with Bulgaria now. The hair's breadth made a difference. There's a kind of uncanny valley in language. Competency can overshoot the mark so that however perfectly we speak a foreign language, speaking it too casually feels like imposture. I don't know why. I like horses, a boy interjected, getting a laugh, and she rolled her eyes. No, really, she said. This is the problem. When we want to be proud, we think of the Nacional Novosrajdene, or we think of Bulgaria na Trimoreta, we think of Tsarevitz. She was right, I thought, though I didn't say anything. They were at the core of what my students thought of as their national identity, the 19th century liberation in Bulgaria's medieval greatness, when its borders had touched three seas, Trimoreta, a phrase the far right used to stoke nationalist feeling and that adorned tourist t-shirts at every cheap souvenir shop. But that doesn't say anything about how we live now, she said. It's all just kill the Ottomans. It doesn't tell us anything about what it means to be Bulgarian now. The temperature rose a little at this. Some of the students leaned forward in their seats, which were situated around a group of desks we had pushed together to make a kind of conference table. I wanted them to look at each other as they spoke. What does, then, a boy asked. What do you think does tell us about Bulgaria now? And another boy said, Berbatov, the soccer star, which made half of the class laugh and the other half groan. Nothing, my student said, raising her voice. Nothing does, that's our problem. That's why the protests won't go anywhere. We have no idea how to be Bulgarian in the real world. We have no idea how we should be. The temperature rose still further at this. A number of voices spoke at once, making noises of protest or skepticism. Come on, I heard, and gluposti, nonsense. And then my students started to speak again in defense. I had let the reins go too slack. Though I wanted to watch things play out, the conversation was too hot. A couple of students were looking my way. I needed to intervene. Poetry, I said, sitting up straight in my chair, which had the effect I wanted. They all turned to me, silent, less obedient than bewildered. I looked at them a moment, a kind of sejura, and then I repeated it, poetry, as though it were the obvious answer to a question, the answer they already knew. That's what poets can do, I said. Poets and artists, they give us ideas to buy into for whole countries to buy into. Like Whitman, I said, whom they had all studied. He was part of the 10th grade curriculum, 
My own 10th graders were reading him now, Song of Myself, and I found it was a different poem because of the protests, which became the context for our reading, though I had read it dozens of times, I read it differently now. Think of what he wants to do in that poem, I said, and when the country was at war with itself, absolutely broken, he wants to make an image of America anyone can buy into. Like that miraculous section, and I use that word, miraculous, I was getting excited. I was getting swept up in Whitman as I always did. It was what I loved about him and what I mistrusted to the feelings he could arouse that could swamp judgment. That section where all he does is name things. I said, well, not things, people. It's just a list. He wants it to include everyone. He wants to find a place for everyone. An equal place, I went on, though I was talking too much now, and a place in his affection too. There are, those, there are those wonderful moments he puts in parentheses, like a whisper, do you remember, where he tells us he loves the person he just named? That's what he thought democracy was, I said, a, name, a poem that named things and made an occasion for you to love them. He wanted to stitch America up, I said. He wanted to break all the divisions down. There's only one time he does the opposite. It's in that same list where he puts a prostitute right next to the president, do you remember? None of them did, but they were paying attention, less interested maybe in the poem or what I was saying than in my excitement, which they observed like some freakish natural phenomenon, I thought. There's a crowd making fun of the prostitute, I said, and that's the one time Whitman separates himself. He says, they laugh at you, but I do not laugh at you. And that's the problem. I hurried on. That's the problem with democracy, the danger of crowds. It's the problem with the protests, too. How do you take a crowd and turn it into a populace? How do you take the voice of a crowd and turn it into the vox populi, the voice of a people? I glanced at the clock and saw that class was almost over. The bell would ring soon. People have to come together without losing their ability to think. Whitman calls it a thoughtful merge. The whole idea of democracy depends on it. And look, I don't think a poem can do what he thought it could. He wanted his poem to be America like magic. He wanted his poem to fix everything that was wrong with the country, which was a lot, I said, trying to lighten the tone, which still is a lot. But what he did was to make an image of America that still feels like something I want to buy into. It still feels like the best image of ourselves. I stopped then, not knowing how to go on, and I was grateful when the bell rang. It let me raise my voice and say, so go be poets, which released them from my overheated feeling and gave them permission to laugh. Thanks, you guys. That was so good. Thank you. Um, am I on the screen or I'd rather see Garth. So I don't care if I'm on the screen or not. Um, I just want to say that just kind of owned the Dead Poet Society. Re, this is the new like Captain My Captain moment in Bulgaria. Um, and Garth, I will sign up for your writing a set piece class soon to be developed. Uh, really beautiful stuff. Thank you for that. Um, other breaking news tonight was that Garth Greenwell certified Sheila Hetty as a genius. And I, I've been saying that for a long time. So I just want to, you know, kind of revel in that validation, but also point out she's just one of the kindest, warmest people you'll ever meet as well. I've been hearing from her group this week that they're just loving their time with her which is amazing um, to get to spend a week with Sheila and work on your process, work on your writing. And she's been doing a great job with that. She is working and she is the author of eight books, including a book for children, a play and various collaborations. Do not pigeonhole her, um, including the New York Times bestseller Women in Clothes, which, collect, which collected the writing from more than 600 women from around the world. Her novels include Tickner, how Should a Person Be, and most recently, Motherhood. 
She is the former interviews editor at The Believer magazine. She has written criticism for The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, Granta, and other places. Her books have been translated into 20 languages. She lives in Toronto. You can see, see her at What's Art For next week on June 26. Let's give it up for Sheila Hetty. Thank you. Um, gee, I wish every introduction called me genius. That's, <laughs> that's the only reason to write is for somebody to say that. Um, uh, I really am very happy to be here. This is my third year at Lighthouse, though of course we're not really at Lighthouse, but I just, it's my favorite. I look forward to it every year. It's just such a warm community, such great people. And um, I've been having such a fun week. And Garth, uh, Garth is one of my favorite writers and people also. Um, we, uh, I don't know, I just, uh, you know, every time I, I think about his books, I get like all blushy and hot. Um, <laughs> and that was such a beautiful piece he, he, you just read, Garth. Um, and so apt and so of the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna read for you today. Um, it's amazing that you can actually get nervous about a reading when you're sitting in your own uh, house. Um, I'm gonna read um, from this book that I'm working on called Pure Color, it's a novel um, and it's done, not done. I'm not really sure, close. Uh, I actually sent a draft to Garth a year ago, um, just about this time to get his feedback on it. And um, cause uh, yeah, and it was really valuable um, and helpful. And um, anyways, it's, I keep emailing him and saying it's better now, it's better now, I promise. Um, in any case, I'm going to read you some passages from, from this book. And uh, it, I'm beginning at the beginning of the book, but uh, then I sort of skip, skip around a little bit. Okay. After forming the heavens and the earth, God, stu God stood back to contemplate creation like a painter standing back from the canvas. This is the moment we are living in, the moment of God standing back. Who knows how long it has been going on for? Since the beginning of time, no doubt. But how long is that? And for how much longer will it continue? You'd think it would only last a minute, this delay of God standing back before stepping forward again to finish the canvas, but it appears to be going on forever. But who knows how long or short this world of ours seems from the vanishing point of eternity. Are you sad to be living in the first draft, shoddily made, rushed, exuberant, malformed? No, you are proud to be strong enough to be living here now, one of God's expendable workers in the first draft of the world. There is some pride in being the ones who will be slaughtered before the better world comes. We are the ones who are made to be thrown out. Here we are, just living in the credits at the end of the movie. Everyone wants to see their name up on a screen and whoever wants it is capable of putting it there. That is the work we are doing collectively now just putting our names up on a screen. We have been given the technology for this one minor thing here at the very end of the world, this one consolation, this booby prize. I would like to come back after my death and see what? Whether my works were kept by humanity, whether my art is being exhibited 50, 75, 100 years from now. So you want to return to earth to Google yourself? Yes, immortality means Googling yourself forever. Now the earth is heating up in advance of its destruction by God, who has decided that the first draft of existence contained too many flaws. Ready to go at creation a second time, getting a more right this time, God appears, splits, and manifests as three art critics in the sky. A large bird who critiques from above, a large fish who critiques from the middle, and a large bear who critiques while cradling in its arms. People born from the bird egg are interested in beauty, order, harmony, and meaning. They look at nature as if from on high in an abstracted way and approach the world from a distance. These people are like birds soaring, flighty, fragile, and strong. People born from the fish egg emerge from a cloud and this cloud contains hundreds of thousands of eggs where the most important thing is not any individual egg but the condition of the many. They are born to critique the world politically because for them it's the collective conditions that count. For a fish mother, it is not any one of her individual eggs that concerns her, but that she lays her eggs in the best conditions 
where the temperature is most right and the current most gentle, so the majority might survive. So a person hatched from a fish egg is concerned with social conditions here on earth, on humanity getting the temperature right for the many. Individual eggs may perish in pursuit of this ideal, but individual eggs don't matter as much to the person hatched from the fish egg as they do to the person who is hatched from a bear. People hatched from a bear egg are like lovers to us all. Each life matters profoundly, and the death of any one creature is a tragic fact. This is not a pragmatic way of thinking in which individuals can be sacrificed for some ultimate end. They choose a few people to love and protect and are untroubled by their choice. They are oriented towards the people around them. We people who are born from these three different eggs will never completely understand each other. We will always think those who are born from a different egg have their priorities all wrong. But fish, birds, and bears are all equally important in the eyes of God. And it wouldn't be a better world if there were only fish. And it wouldn't be a better world if there were only birds. God needs creation considered by all three. But here on earth, it is hard to believe it. The fish find the critiques of the birds superficial, while the birds are bored by the critiques of the fish. Nothing makes a person feel like their life's work or their selves are less seen than when being judged by someone from a different egg. Yet birds should be grateful that someone is making the political critique so they don't have to. And a fish should be grateful that someone is making the aesthetic critique so they can focus on the political one. God is most proud of his creation as an aesthetic thing. You have only to look at the exquisite harmony of sky and leaves and trees and clouds and the moon and the sun and the stars to see what a great job God did aesthetically. So those born from a bird egg are the most pleased of all. Those born from the fish egg are the most upset and those born from the bear egg aren't too happy either. Perhaps God shouldn't conceive of creation as a work of art the next time around. Then maybe a better job will be done with the moral and political aspects of living. But is that even possible for an artist to shape their work into a form which is not in the end an art form? This particular story concerns a bird-like woman named Mira who is torn between her love for the mysterious Annie who seems to mirror like a distant fish and her love for her father who seems to mirror like a warm bear. The heart of the artist is a little bit hollow. The bones of the artist are a little bit hollow. The brain of the artist is a little bit hollow, but this allows them to fly. Those who aren't hatched from the bird egg might wonder why birds who seem to have no heart, no morality and no brain are the ones who were born to give the world its metaphors, pictures and stories. Why should this have been given to the birds? A bird can learn to walk on the ground like a bear and she can spend her whole life walking, but she will never be happy this way while a fish on the shore gasps for breath, desperate to get back to the sea. A bird finds its nourishment anywhere it can. She reaches her beacon to the soil and finds her sustenance there. Fish and, bir fish and bears don't understand this about birds and ask with real curiosity, where do you get your ideas from? Not understanding the real answer. I get them from somewhere dirty. Halmira would have loved to be born of the bear egg. How she would love to be an ambassador of a gentle and enduring love down here on this earth. Yet whenever she sets her heart on such actions, they are wished for, strived for, and barely achieved. This is the stumblingest part of her, the most nonsensical part, the part of her that is most scattered and always to blame. It gives the bird such a plodding feeling to roam about the earth like a bear, how long it takes her to get anywhere, how heavy and earthbound walking is when she knows how to fly. But she shouldn't feel bad about being born of a bird egg, for how beautiful are the flowers in her window, the flowers on her windowsill over there, how their green and gold makes each passerby smile that someone loves beauty and cares. Her flowers make us think of the flowers in the soul of the person who put them there. It is the flowers in the soul of the person who put them there that makes us happy and enlivens our hearts. The beauty of these flowers is a clue to the beauty of a human heart. They are a keyhole into a human heart. And a fish's political action, even a very small one effectively done is a glimpse into a human heart. And a glimpse into one heart is a glimpse into many. And the hopes of the bear are shared by all of humankind. And what opens one heart opens many. Mira left home. She found an apartment which was only one room. Then she got a job. She worked most evenings at a lamp store. The lamp store sold Tiffany lamps and other lamps made of colored glass. Each lamp was extremely expensive. The least expensive lamp cost $400. This was a month's salary for her. 
Every night before they closed up shop, she had to turn off every single lamp. That took about 11 minutes. Mostly she turned off lamps by pulling on a little beaded cord. You had to be careful not to let the cord snap back and hit the bulb or the lamp. You had to pull the cord with a delicate sort of care. It was tedious work. Mira didn't have the morning shift. That person had to turn on the lamps. Their job was no better than hers. Across the street from them was another lighting store. Hers was just a lamp store, but the other store sold all sorts of fixtures and also ceiling lights with fans attached, very modern lighting in contrast to their old fashioned wares. People preferred the store across the street. The owners of Mira's store had just enough customers to stay in business, but most couples went across the street and spent their money on modernistic white lamps and off-white lamps made of industrial plastic. Mira's coworkers felt sorry for themselves and said those people had no taste. When it was time to close up shop, Mira would see the thin man who worked across the street turning off each light one by one. They both had the same nightly task. She felt that no one in the world understood her, but she wondered if he did. And yet, embarrassed by their similarity, she, she avoided eye contact with him. She felt so alone in those days. Not that she minded. It is only when you get older that everyone makes you feel bad about being alone or implies that being with other people is somehow better because it proves you to be likable. Being unlikable wasn't why she was alone. She was alone so she could feel herself living. She was alone so she could hear herself thinking. How did she find the job at the lamp store? She must have walked past it and seen a little sign. How did people find jobs back then before we all knew what everyone else wanted? Little paper signs. She found working in a lamp store to be a very modest thing. If one lamp sells, it's a good day. If two lamps sell, it's a celebration. How did she find the room she lived in? There was probably a little piece of paper taped up somewhere. The house had two bedrooms on the second floor and a bathroom that was shared. There was a large apartment on the main floor which was occupied by a youngish gay man who came home one night all bloodied and beaten. They met each other by accident on the stairs then turned away from each other and cried. On her floor lived an oily man a few years older than she was who Mira almost never saw. He was reclusive and odd. Their bathroom had a dirty tub, so she never took a bath and she rarely showered. Because the man cooked dinners in the kitchen, she got a hot plate for her room. Off of her bedroom was a drafty porch with wood slat walls and subtly distorted windows on all three sides, which would have been nice to read in if the weather had been warm. But it was late fall when Mira moved in and she was forced to move out before the spring. She kept all the books she owned on a bookshelf in that shivering little room. When it was time to move out, she opened the door to collect them and found they had molted and their pages gone wavy with the damp, deep cold of the winter. Mira hadn't meant to kiss Annie on the back of her neck so centrally the first time they were alone together outside. They were standing at the glass door of Annie's apartment right up near the street. Mira was genuinely overtaken. She started kissing her, then hearing the little moans continued for a bit longer then stopped. It was the first time in her life that she had been so overcome. It was lust, but it was also a sudden kind of love. She had just meant to push aside the long, thin sheath of Annie's hair and plant a little kiss on her. Mira was the cute kind of person who in those days could get away with such spontaneity. But when she planted her lips, the deep smell of Annie kept her there, close up by the heat of her neck. And so she kissed Annie longer, kissing her neck with her whole mouth. There was more silence in the air around Mira as she did this, than there had ever been before. The silence was a silence in her heart as well. There was something about Annie, some power she had that Mira didn't recognize until she was kissing her. Then she understood that she was under some spell and she knew why men down through the centuries had always feared women, feeling them to possess some otherworldly power that had to be controlled. Mira was suddenly filled with all the things she could do with Annie, all the things she would have loved to do, letting herself be led without any thought at all, with the same blankness in her head that she felt as she touched her. And she knew that she could keep on going with even deeper regions of her body and heart. She saw a future unfurling between them, even as she tried to resist it, but she had never before seen a future so convincingly unfurl. But Annie didn't mention what happened again. And as Mira was young and inclined to shame, they never spoke of it again. Feces, worms, piss, trouble, this is where we are now. Our dressing up has led us nowhere. Our manners have led us nowhere. Being in love was just a fantasy of a world that was not entirely piss and dust, but what a fantasy her face provoked. In some books, you are supposed to stay away from such a woman, but in other books, she is the one you are supposed to love. 
In life, there are no sure signs whether a woman is the one you're supposed to stay away from or the one you're supposed to love. A person can waste her whole life without even meaning to, all because another person has a really great face. Did God think of this when he was making the world? Why didn't God give everyone the exact same face? Perhaps it will be like that in the next draft of existence, and people living in that future time might not, not even imagine that there was ever a first draft in which everyone had their own face. The thought might disgust them, but the thought will never lead them to thinking about how much time our various faces wasted. They will not think about how some faces ruined the lives of others who had less beautiful faces, or that having a beautiful face might ruin the life of the person who had one. But doesn't it all work out in the end, no matter which face you got? Yes, people with ugly faces can lead beautiful lives, and people with beautiful faces can lead ugly ones. And a beautiful face can draw you right down deep into the world's greatest ugliness. But in the next draft of existence, they will not understand this, how, one's person, how one person's beautiful face could draw another person deep into their greatest sorrow. Thank you. That was so great. Um, I never thought of creation as a process that could use some revision. I mean, I have thought that, but not in quite that same way. Uh, <laughs> and I love that. And I also love um, the idea that immortality means Googling yourself forever. <laughs> that sounds like also like hell, um, <laughs> both things. So I encourage you guys to, to talk to each other as much as you want, but I, I'm gonna throw a question out there first and then I, I'll come back with questions from the Q and A. Um, I heard today this, this quote, uh, which is, if you're not willing to be uncomfortable, you can't progress, which I don't think necessarily is maybe the way people like thinking about it. Maybe it's better to think about it as without being uncomfortable, you can't grow or you can't change or you can't do things like that. And I'm not gonna say who said this, except, you know, I don't wanna get too highbrow on you guys, but it was the, the little digital spin instructor um, that I was watching. So uh, I wonder if that sounds true to you guys as a philosophy for writing, a philosophy for living. Can you discuss, and I'll get off camera. Well, it's certainly a philosophy for exercising, which is why I don't do it very much. <laughs> I hate being uncomfortable. I don't know, Garth, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yes. I mean, I guess I think so. You know, I mean, I, or I guess that like the uncomfortable is a place that we should dwell much more often. Um, you know, I, I do worry a little bit about that, about a kind of that we're losing our tolerance of a kind of necessary, of a kind of discomfort that's necessary to sort of sociality, that's necessary to being a human in the world with other humans. Um, and, you know, Sheila, that made me think, first of all, every time I encounter your work, I feel like my brain fills with a single thought or with a single phrase, which is Sheila, your mind. Like, it's so astonishing to kind of see. But, you know, something I was thinking about as I was listening to you read, and I'm so eager to see the new version of this novel, um, is like how desperately we need a theory of temperament and how sort of desperately, you know, we need um, how desperately we need a kind of sense of the value of different temperaments, the sense of a value of kind of differently weighted systems of values in a world, and that the sort of tolerance for that is necessary to any world we could bear to live in. And that tolerance is a tolerance for discomfort, for sort of recognizing that other people aren't going to care about exactly the things that I care about. And that doesn't that doesn't make them evil, that in fact, that diversity is contributing to the good of the world. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny, I, I just got back on Twitter, um, speaking about discomfort. <laughs> and uh, I find it a very difficult place to write. Um, I tweet and then like two minutes later, I always inevitably delete the tweet. And I feel like for me, it's because there's a difference. I realized what it was, it's like, there's a difference between speaking through fiction and where you can employ metaphor and there's some distance between you and the text that you don't have to account for in some way. And in Twitter, it's just you. 
And I, I realized how uncomfortable I am speaking as myself to in this, in that medium, you know, how comfortable I've got with the, the form of the novel in which, um, in which you don't have to always mean what you say. Uh, and you, you, you say things because there's a beauty to it. Um, and you say things as like a proposition and um, you say things to see like, what does it sound like if I say this? And what does it mean if I put these thoughts with other thoughts? And I, I guess that's just the difference between trying to make, to use words to make art and then use words to make pronouncements. And like art sort of feels to me like actually like I, it's the opposite of the pronouncement. It's the opposite of Twitter. Like I, I don't have any pronouncements, you know, I have like, I want to put a collection of possibilities together and it's just not the, for me, it's not the medium for that. I, 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 I think it's a tough, it used to, it used to be a place that it was possible. I found so much beautiful absurdity there, but I, I feel like it's becoming less art, which is good. I mean, it's becoming more politics. That's great. Like that, it's a very useful, amazing. That's why I got on it. Cause I was like, the world is in such a moment right now. And I want to see what people are saying. Um, but yeah, I don't feel comfortable speaking as not an art, uh, outside of art, I think. Speaking yeah. outside of through art. I mean, I feel like there is a certain kind of thinking that depends upon the frame. Like, you know, there's something so important and kind of magical to putting a frame around a piece of reality and sort of turning that into an arena for a certain kind of thinking that doesn't have the same connection to responsibility as sort of other kinds of uses of language. Um, you know, it feels really important to me that sort of we create these little um, arenas, these little pieces of reality um, where we can experiment, where we can experiment with thinking, where we can also, you know, um, so I always find myself sort of feeling the inadequacy of my own apparatus for thinking when I try to think about the relationship between art and politics, you know, and especially between art and activism. And like, you know, art is central to my sense of myself in the world. Activism is central to my sense of myself in the world. And yet it is very important to me to conceive of those as distinct activities um, for two reasons. One, because I never want to delude myself into thinking that writing a poem has sort of discharged my responsibilities as a citizen, which it does not. Um, and two, because it seems to me that, you know, two things. One, that, you know, activism has to be responsible in a certain way and has to be kind of under the control of the conscious in a certain way. Whereas art, it seems to me, can't be responsible in that way because, you know, I think art is made in response to urge, that it's made in a condition of unknowing, um, you know, that in some way, it has to be protected from that kind of that kind of responsibility. And yet, I don't want that to turn into an argument that sort of wants to claim that art is hermetically sealed from history, from the world, from the social, from, I mean, maybe certain kinds of um, ideas about, you know, whether something has been adequate to a certain kind of complexity in its response to the world, like all of that you know, art is absolutely situated in all of these things. And yet um, it seems to me really important to sort of um, maintain that distance and to sort of say that, right, the I that speaks in a poem or the I that speaks in a novel is different, importantly different from the I that speaks in the kind of responsible social public world, which I do think Twitter is more and more becoming, like we are very much held accountable to what we say on Twitter. Um, I sort of refuse people who try to hold me accountable in the same way to things that, you know, a sort of construct who uses the pronoun I um, says in my novels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it makes, it's fair for uh, a book to be looked at in the context of the world that it comes out in and to be understood alongside everything else that's happening in society and judged according to all sorts of different needs that people have as readers. But yeah, I think the difference is like when you're making it, there's a certain degree to which you don't completely know what you're making and you have to sort of trust your instinct 
thinks. Your intellect can't answer all the questions for you. What have I made? And, you know, and I think that that's, you just kind of have to be okay with that and know that um, it's, it, it, it's, it's not for you to, I mean, you can know what it is for yourself, but, and at the same time, you know that, it, you know that it's going to be something different for everybody who reads it. And um, I don't know, like, I don't feel, uh, I don't feel a sort of, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, I think there's something about working on a book over many years that leads it to be the creation of a different kind of intelligence than the intelligence that exists in the present and that always exists in the present moment. There's something about the repetition of returning to a text, thinking about it, sleeping, years pass, you change, um, all that layering that makes it a little bit, you can't say, um, it's not a statement. It's like a, it's, um, I don't know it, it time goes into it in a different way you're not the what you're not one person it's not the I that publishes it that says there's a book it's the five years of eyes and the unconscious eye and you know society and everything that goes into you so yeah it's it's hard to feel the same sense of like I've done a bad thing if I've written a bad book I don't entirely feel like it's me um in the present who's done that action yeah, and I guess I feel like, you know, anytime, and I, maybe this will be the last thing I say um, before we open it up to Q and A's, but, um, you know, I guess I feel like it feels really true to me that good art is always smarter than the person who makes it. And that one way, and, and that, that just seems true to me. And so I asked myself, like, what is that additional intelligence? Like, where does that come from? And kind of, I love what you say about time entering a work differently, um, a work that takes us years, absolutely. And then also form itself and the kind of aesthetic tradition and the way that certain pieces of language and certain moves get magnetized because of the way in which they're placed in an aesthetically charged form. Um, and also because of the particular tradition in which a writer is working out of. Um, and all of that is a way in which, um, yeah, as I say, the, and as you say, sort of the intelligence in a work is not the same intelligence that's putting tweets on Twitter. Um, yeah, that seems like yeah, an important it, distinction. I don't want to be lost. Yeah, it's like the intelligence of time, like that is brought into the work. It's mm -hmm. not just your stupid brain right. <laughs> day to day. Absolutely. Having yeah. just woken up from a nap. Totally. That's great. I love that. Um, so Nikki Beer, who's a lovely poet who lives here in Denver, uh, writes, happy Pride Month, everyone. Garth and Sheila, are there any new works by queer writers that you're particularly excited about right now? I always feel, I always feel so on the hook when people ask me for book recommendations. I should be, um, I should be more prepared than this. Um, but yes, uh, there's obviously Brandon Taylor's novel, my friend Brandon Taylor, whom I absolutely adore. Um, a book that came out earlier this year that is pretty much taking the world by storm and that I hugely recommend. Um, there's Alana Massad's book that I'm really excited about. In poetry, Carl Phillips's new book of poems is a marvel. He's one of our um, great poets alive. And then a book that's not out yet, another poetry book, but that's coming, um, is Henri Cole's new book of poems, um, which I think is just, um, one, a gorgeous book, and two, thinking about the relationship between poetry and politics. Um, Henri Cole, if you know his work, he's very much a bird person. Uh, he's very much a kind of esthete. Um, and it has been fascinating to watch him in recent years um, start to address politics. And in this new book, he sort of marshals against Trumpism, um, a kind of politics of gentleness that I just find enormously moving. So um, his new book, I really recommend. And it'll be out, I think, in September on Recall. Yeah, and I'll just add one more. Um, Billy Ray Belcourt uh, is a Cree, uh, queer author, Canadian, um, and 
he just put out a book called A History of My Brief Body. I think it probably just came out a month or so ago. And it's sort of about like, yeah, being an indigenous person and being queer and being in the academy and being a writer and, and where do you, it's sort of autobiographical, but also essayistic and, and intellectual and very moving. And I, I just, that was like the last book I, I read that I just really kind of fell in love with. And yeah, I think he's brilliant, brilliant young writer. That's great. Um, those of you who are interested, Rachel's been posting links to these books in the chat. Um, Anonymous asks or says first, both of you write about powerful themes with powerful styles. How do you keep from hiding behind your style to say what you really mean? I don't know for me it's not uh the style is what I really mean <laughs> like it's um I I don't really distinguish the style from what I'm trying to say the 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 language that I use um is what I'm saying I don't yeah I, the terms of that question sort of I I can't really answer that um I mean, sometimes you can, you know, when I'm editing and I see like, this is a really pretty sentence, but uh, it doesn't mean anything, then I'll cut it. Um, that's the best I can say. Like sometimes there's writing that you love and you kind of, it's that Ernest Hemingway, kill your darlings thing. Like sometimes you actually have to cut like, oh, you're so proud of that line, but it doesn't like add anything and, and you don't agree, you know, but, but apart from that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I feel really similarly, I mean, I turn, and this connects with what I was saying earlier. I mean, the reason I make art is because there are things I want to think about that defeat all of my other tools for thinking. And so I need the particular kind of thinking that is enabled by style, that is enabled by this kind of aesthetic formal pressure that I'm thinking about. Uh, I mean, the kind of syntax that I'm drawn to, this sort of recursive, but also propulsive um, syntax is a kind of technology for thinking. It's not a container for thought. Um, so it's not that I have thoughts and then I put them into style. It's that, you know, this peculiar technology of, of this particular kind of sentence um, is itself productive of the thought. So, you know, and also the idea of meaning what I say, I mean, in, in ways we were just talking about, I think that's a really complicated proposition in art. Um, I want what is said in my work to be charged in a particular way um, that might not have a one-to-one -one relationship with the truth, but is in another, but is, you know, doing work to inhabit ambivalence, ambiguity, and doubt, um, which is a kind of thinking that I think art um, sort of uh, allows us to indulge in. I think those are humane virtues. I think they're virtues of, hum of humanness to be able to dwell in ambiguity, ambiguity, ambivalence, and doubt. That's something that our public discourse almost entirely um, makes impossible right now. But art, because of those magic frames I was talking about, um, creates a space for it. You're so articulate, Garth. <laughs> Stop it, Sheila. I would say both <laughs> are guilty of that. Um, someone has uh, posted the same question over and over, and I know this is actually a bigger conversation which is, <laughs> which is both of you do this very well. Um, small task, teach us how to write about sex and shame. I knew it was connected to sex. Why would you <laughs> ask both of us something over and over? Um, I don't know how you feel about it, Garth, but for me, writing about sex feels no different from writing about anything else. I think maybe where sometimes sex writing goes wrong is like, now I go into this other form of thinking and writing and feeling. And to me, like sex, writing about sex is like writing about just being a human in the world in, in relation. And I, I think this is really true of Garth's work. I mean, I think Garth's the best writer I can think of who writes about sex, period. Like it's, when in Garth's work, it's like, the sex is a is a is a space where the relationship is exposed. So like you're writing about sex, but you're really writing about these people. You're writing about like the psychology of this person. You're writing about power. Like it's the sex is a is something that shows all this other stuff. 
stuff that you're interested in. You know, I think that sex writing can be really gross when like there's no other meaning to it. I mean, it can be great, like porn, but that's sort of like pornography, you know, but, but I feel like um, for myself as well, like writing about, writing about sex is just, I don't understand actually why it's not written about more. Like when I read Garth's book, I'm like, why don't more people write about sex? Like it's such a huge part of life. Um, and even if you don't have it, it's a big part of life. <laughs> and uh, I think that there's a feeling of like, I don't know, I, I don't know what, why, why it becomes somehow suddenly uh, riddled with weirdness, sex writing. Yeah, I mean, this is one of like the big questions I have is just like why there is this bizarre prejudice against representations of sex um, in art in general in the Anglo world, um, but maybe especially in writing. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's especially bizarre in English because I mean, one of the great gifts of writing in English is that from really from the beginning of English as a literary language, you know, Chaucer and Shakespeare used all of the words for the sexual body and made them part of the texture of poetry in a way that's not true for all other languages. I mean, the, the, my translator into Bulgarian has a terrible struggle because there is not a language of the sexual body that feels native to poetry. Whereas in English, it's absolutely true. So it's just, it's utterly bizarre to me that sort of there is this prejudice that says this huge territory of human feeling is off limits to art, like crazy talk. In terms of, I am utterly like contradictory. I have two utterly contradictory thoughts when it comes to writing sex. On one hand, I feel like Absolutely. It is a myth that sex is uniquely difficult to write, that writing about sex, like if you, everything is almost impossible to write. Like if you set yourself the task of really putting on the page the experience of eating a muffin in the morning, that is impossible, you know? And in the same way, so like in some ways I think writing sex is no different than writing about eating a, mu a muffin. On the other hand, in a totally kind of contradictory way, it does seem to me, I, I do sort of claim a kind of privileged um, status for sex, because I do think sex kind of puts, like I talk about sex as being a crucible of humanness, that it sort of puts us under pressure in a way that exposes all of these kinds of interlocked contradictions that to me make the human interesting. Like it's the time when we are most in our bodies. And yet I also think that the experience of sex is what gives us all of our, all our intimations of something that exceeds our bodies. It's when we're sort of most in our own sensations, but it's also when we're most, if it's interesting, sex, when we're most attuned to the sensations of another. In all of these ways, it does seem to me kind of a unique um, opportunity and therefore maybe does present unique challenges for writing. So utterly contradictory thoughts. In terms of shame, you know, I mean, another thing that I love about the, the what art can do in terms of putting a frame around a little piece of reality, a little piece of existence, um, is that it allows me, who am an utter coward, um, it gives me a kind of bravery to orient myself toward um, well, discomfort to bring us back to where we started this conversation. I mean, I often, so I was thinking, I was talking before about sentences feeling to me like a tool for thinking, not just a sort of container for thought. And, you know, in some sense, they do feel to me like heat seeking devices and the heat they are turning toward is uncomfortable emotion, is pain or is shame. Um, I am not very good at doing that outside of the frame of art. Um, but somehow, if I sort of put myself on the page and um, it allows me to sort of face the abyss um, in a way that, um, I mean, doesn't exactly feel safe. I, I don't think actually art making is as safe as sometimes now we like to think it is. Um, but, you know, there is a kind of courage I get from the accoutrements of art that allows me to address things like shame. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, you guys, there are so many good questions in the Q&A. And unfortunately, we're out of time. We have to acknowledge that both Garth and Sheila are teaching early tomorrow. And um, I do know that that Garth will be back. He'll be back on the screen for the, the salon tomorrow night and Sheila later um, next week. 
I thank you both so much for your time, your generosity, your good work. Um, and I thank all of you on the other end of this Zoom for being here. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Garth. Thank you, Sheila. And um, pick up their books, you guys. It's time well spent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.